Hi again! This is the second volume of the tutorial for beginners in Revit. Ah, this time the video is a bit shorter than two hours, but long enough, as here you will continue learning very useful tips that will help you to improve the knowledge you got in the first video. Also, have a look at the list of contents in the description, so you can have an idea what we are going to cover in this video. Let's proceed! In this chapter we are going to talk about editing wall profiles. When we draw a wall on the project, it has a constant height. But let's look at this example where we have this staircase. I'm going to switch to the 3D view and suppose that I want to convert the wall in the shape I'm showing here. To edit a wall profile, it's easy. I double click when I highlight the wall, it switches to the sketch mode and now I can easily modify the wall as I like. For example, I can draw a diagonal line here then use Trim Extends to Corner to erase the parts that I don't need. Then I click on the tick to confirm the changes. So this is how it works. However, I find a bit hard to edit a wall profile in a 3D view. So I recommend it to do it in a section view or in an elevation. In this example, I'm going to do it in a section. I go to the ground floor and then I'm going to insert a section, find the icon on the view tab, then I draw the line for the crop view. The area covered has to be the staircase, of course, so I click on these arrows to switch the direction and extend the area by dragging this grip to the left, so I cover everything. Finally, if I hover the section icon, it says Section 2, so I know it's this one, but let's change the name, for example to Section Stairs. Now I'm going to open the section. First I'm going to extend the crop region to cover all the wall profiles. Now it's better. Then to facilitate, I temporarily hide these two walls from the section view. I select both, click on the glasses at the bottom and select Hide Element. Now if I double click on the wall, I can only see the profile of the stairs and it's also easier to detect the snap points here. Oh, at this moment my visual style is set as hidden lines. If I switch to wireframe, I can see also the stair rises if I need to use snap stair. In this case, as I don't need, the hidden line is fine for me. Let's modify the profile. With the line tool active, I'm going to draw a line along the slope until this point. Next, I'm going to move the diagonal line 0.3 meters up, click in this endpoint go up now and type 0.3. Then I can easily draw a horizontal line here to connect to the wall, just to the wall face. And right next, a vertical line. And don't worry about the distance, we will set it now. Select the line, then as I want it to be 50 cm from the wall face, I have to change first the position of this grip and finally set the distance to 50 cm, 0.5 meters. Finally, readjust the position of this line and use trim to corner to erase the extra segments. So the wall profile is ready. Don't forget to always confirm or cancel to exit the sketch mode. And in the 3D view, I can see how the wall looks like. Now, I want to show you a warning that may appear to you. Let's go back to the sketch mode. This time, I'm going to modify the wall again. I know, I'm in the 3D view. 
but when it's easy, you can edit the wall profile without big concerns. I want to extend the line towards the wall. Delete these two lines and then use Extend to Corner here. Then I click on the tick and I get this message. It says, the best way to control the top and the base is to modify the constraints. What do you think happened? The wall highest point is no longer at the former height. And on the properties, the top constraint, you can see that it's set to up to level first floor, which no longer matches. I change it to unconnected and click on apply. And you can see I won't have that problem anymore because I removed the constraint. Anyway, if I didn't change anything, it would still be fine. The thing is that it's common to edit some elements later in our projects, and if the things are not set in the best way, we may have problems in the future. Wall openings In Revit, there is a tool available to make a wall opening. What I mean is a passage from two rooms without placing a door. Something like this. Notice also this wall is only one element. This is a very practical feature in Revit. Let's have a look at how it works. I'm going to click on the option Wall at the opening panel, Architecture tab. Then, the first step is selecting a wall to make the opening. Then, we click on two points which will define the opening section. OK, it's done as you can see. However, the dimensions have quite random values, but that's something we will edit just right away. To set the specific length on the opening, just click on the dimension and insert the one that you desire. But you can see it's not enough as the distances from the wall still have these complex values. How can we place the wall opening at the middle of a room? There is a simple trick for that. In these grips, we can extend or reduce the size of the opening. I click in this one once, and now this length is 0.9. Then I go to the grip at the other side, and I click until I match the first value. Now that they are equal, if I change the length of the opening, the distances at the side readjust to keep the section staying in the middle. I can change again to 1.7 and it still stays in the center. Now let's select the opening section and switch to a 3D view. Here you can see it, here you can see it in this perspective. Grips are shown to change the opening size, but I want you to focus on the properties, as they are a bit different than for the walls. The range between top and base constraints are defined by levels. Even we can set the top constraint as unconnected and set a specific value for the height. If the top constraint is at the first floor, we can modify the top offset of the wall. It's a negative value because it's going down from the top constraint. Now be careful. If I did this dimension on the project, what actually happens is that the opening height didn't change, it just moved a bit down from the base. That's why now we have a base offset negative. It's not really noticeable because it's just a bit up than zero. I show you an example here which we can better see these kind of situations. Due to that, the best is to modify the offset distances at the properties. If I set 0.5 and click on Apply, the base offset stayed at 0 and the unconnected height has a precise value of 2.5 meters. Let's see some properties of walls. I'm going to select this exterior wall and I can see it's a basic wall family with the type R-Tutorial exterior wall.
This one was not included in the library. I created it. Now I select all the walls that are included in this type. It's easy. Just click with the right button, go to select all instances and click either on visible view or entire project. OK, now if I go to edit type, there are some characteristics. Let's start with width and structure. As you can notice, I am not able to change the width here. That's the total width of the wall. So instead, I have to click on edit the structure and change the thickness of each material. In fact, in this wall type, there are no specific materials associated. As you can see there, all the structure fits on the core, so its thickness is exactly the total thickness of the wall. I can change the width here, but first, I'm going back and duplicate the wall and create a new type. And on the title, we can specify, for example, the value of the new width. 0.34 or 340 millimeters if you want. Of course, here, as this R tutorial is a type that I created, I could rename it and edit it if I'm sure I will not need it anymore. It is just not recommendable to change and rename the types that are already installed in the program or the ones that came on the family libraries, because if you do it, there is no way to recover them back. So I changed the structure to 0.34, click OK and the selected walls update its size. But yes, be careful when you try to modify walls in an existing floor plan, as you may get some problems. Here you can see the notification. The wall expanded a bit inside and some joints are no longer in the same position, as well as the sofas that are no longer aligned with the wall. Basically. The best is, before drawing the walls, make sure that you set a width you think you won't need to change it later, and you avoid these dimensioning problems. Now let's look at an example with a more complex type, for example this one. I'm going to draw a wall and change the visual style to consistent colors. This is just to help you, you will see. This time. The total width is 339 mm, which is the sum of all those layers. They are all in order, and in this case, the finish made of brick is at the top. And now, if you pay attention at this perspective, you can see the thickness of each component makes sense with the value showing here. However, if the wall is upside down, the order on the list keeps the same. Just be aware of that. To edit the materials used of each component, click on one of them and choose the one that suits you. As you can see, there are a lot of materials available by default in Revit. Now we are going to add rooms to the project. Rooms are annotative objects, they are no real elements. Of course, those tags are not going to be painted on the floor. They are just for annotation and at the end, we can create room schedules very quickly. So, to start, let's learn how to add rooms. To add a room, we click on the icon at the Architecture tab, then I just click in an enclosed area surrounded by walls, for example here. Then I press Escape. Now let's rename the room. For that, I need to hover the room name and tag and double click at that moment. Change to bedroom. And for the tag, when you add the room for the first time, it always shows one, room number one. In this case, it's here 24. Why? Because this is an old project that I had already added rooms there. And then I delete them just to make this tutorial and the program just continues counting from where I was before. Anyway, that's ok, we can change this to 1 and consequently, the next rooms will count as 2, 3, 4, etc. Another way to change the name and numbering is by selecting the room, although to select a room I have to search a bit with the mouse until this box with the crosses highlights. 
Now it's the moment to click. The room is selected. Then, on the properties, I can change the values on identity data. And I update on the view. Let's continue to add more rooms here. Activate room again. Then I click for placing the room number 2. I can continue placing rooms all together in a row, because it's quicker. Another one here, kitchen, WC, and then the hall. At the end, I rename each of them. Now let's see a different situation. When I add a room in the living room, you can see that because I have openings, all these three sections are considered part of the same room. However, sometimes I want these sections separate. And for that there is a tool called Room Separator. Basically, I draw a line to separate areas that I want to consider different rooms. I make a line to divide the dining and the living room and another one to separate it from the stairs. It's very simple, as you can see. Then I can use the room command again, and this time I am able to add different rooms in the three places. Now let's look at the room data. Apart from number and name, I can add more information, for example a comment if necessary. Let's say I put a comment on the kitchen explaining that it has different areas. When you finish writing it, you have to press enter, otherwise the information is not recorded. Then we can add departments. In small projects like a residential house for an average family, usually they are not really needed because there aren't a lot of stories there. However, for a hospital or a project of a high school, maybe it's important to group specific rooms in specific departments, so we will get things more organized. Let's say I want a kitchen in a specific department, common areas. I insert that name in this blank and press enter. Here, a color was assigned to the room, however, this won't happen if you are doing this for the first time, but I will explain that later. Then, I want to add the living room and the dining. I select the living room, hold Ctrl, select the dining, then go to the department section, and if you click on the arrow, it should be already there. I can also add the laundry to the same department. Then for the bedroom, I create a new department called Bedrooms, a WC department, and also another one for the passage areas, the corridors and the stairs. Now let's learn how to add a legend. Go to the Annotate tab, click on Color Fill Legend, and now I can put it, for example, at the side. To edit this, select the legend. You can see the Modified tab is now personalized for Color Fill Legends. I'm going to click on Edit Scheme, and here we can change the colors to the ones that we want. Then, if you look at the section at the left, we can decide if we want to define a section by department or name. In this case, we could set a color for each room. And now the legend is displayed by name. Now look at the example here. I hadn't assigned a color scheme before. That's why I don't have colors yet. When you do it for the first time, it says no color scheme assigned to view. You place it on the project, and then you get this window, where you have to choose rooms. Then click on OK, 
and by default it automatically applies to the department. Part 2 Detail lines are annotation objects in Revit, and they are used for annotation purposes, in the same way that we use dimension lines or text. Now, suppose I want to draw a line here to indicate this is a different area of that room. I go to the Annotate tab, click on Detail Line, then go to this endpoint and draw it, for example, towards that wall. As you can notice, several line styles are loaded by default into the project, and we can always create new ones if we want. Let's select the line and bring it to wide lines. One main characteristic of the detail lines is that they only show in the view that I create them. This is very important. If I draw, for example, a circle outside and go to a 3D view, you can see that it's not showing there. Now, on the Architecture tab, there is a very similar tool, Model Lines, and you can see that the symbol is also identical. But what is the difference between them? Model Lines are real elements, and that means they will appear in all the views as soon as we draw them. I'm going to activate the Model Line on the Architecture tab, then the Line Style is find this one, for example, this could be a pavement at the entrance of the house, and when I finish, I can switch again to the 3D view, and this time, look, the lines appear there. Convert detail lines in model lines. Now, let's see this example. We have here a plan view of a kitchen and I will draw two dashed lines to indicate that the area of the right is dedicated for dining. Turn on Detail Line. And then I will use the line style Hidden Lines, which are dashed green lines. So I'm going to draw two here. Now that I have finished, I switch to the 3D view, and as you expect, they are not displayed there. Great, but suppose that later I have changed my mind and I want these lines to appear in all the views. Imagine them as a real separation, for example, a boundary painted on the floor, even if it sounds a bit hypothetical. But that's simple. If I select both, at the Modify tab, there is an option to convert detail lines into model lines. Click there and they will show up in all the views that we have in this file. The opposite is also possible. I can convert model lines in detail lines. But then, have in mind that these lines keep showing only in the current view. The system erases them from all the other perspectives. Now let's see a different example. This time, I want to draw model lines on this wall. Here, the lines can represent real objects, just as wall joints or a separation between different materials. But how can I do this? Let's see. When you try to draw a line directly in the wall, you can notice it's getting a bit hard to snap points here, and even the vertical direction. It looks like that we can't draw exactly on the place we expect. But if I rotate the view, you can see the lines actually went to the ground floor. And that's because I have the placement plane set as ground floor. So I need to change it. I click on the list, but all the other options are still floor plans. What should I do? I have to pick that wall as my specific drawing plane. I select Pick, and in this window, I choose Pick a Plane. Then we have to select the wall, but be careful. Make sure the correct wall is highlighted the moment just before you click. Ah, and click only once. We may think nothing happened because the wall is not highlighted anymore, 
but you can always be sure that it was selected if you look at the placement plane. Finally, I can easily draw the lines using the snaps at the windows and to connect to the roof, there are also intersections here. Now let's learn how we can edit these line types as well as line weights. This time I have drawn some detailed lines. Here we have a line in the hidden line style, while the lines that form this rectangle are thin lines. Ah, and in Revit there is no polyline tool. If I want to move the rectangle, I need to select all the lines together first, as each line is independent. Now let's go to the Manage tab, Additional Settings, and I'm going to select Line Styles. These are the ones that come by default with Revit. It's possible to modify the colors and the weights, but I cannot delete them. This is important. For example, I'm going to change the hidden lines to red color and then click on apply and you can see the changes. Now, look at the line weight projection. This is quite particular. Instead of specifying a length, I need to choose a number from 1 to 16 and the greater the number, the thicker the lines. If I change this to 4, the hidden lines turned a bit wider than they were before. On the tab at the right, we can set the type of line that we want to use. There is an interesting range of patterns here. For example, if I select dot, it has this format. Now, if you look at this list, maybe you remember that some of the lines that are here were not available to choose when we draw model or detail lines. For example, the lines used for sketch mode are magenta. But if I prefer, I can change the color always when I want. To create a new style, I can go to Modify Subcategories, click on New, and then I can add the name that I wish. It goes to the line category, and at the end, click on OK. In conclusion, if you want to use your personal line styles, I recommend to create a bunch of them, just the ones that you need, of course, and keep the default styles unchanged. And remember that this only applies to the file that you are currently working on. However, a trick to avoid doing this process all the time is creating a template file with all those styles there. Now, let's look how Revit manages line weights. For that, we will go to the settings, which are located just below the line styles. Here we have a very complete table with lots of values, so let's have a look at what they mean. It's easy. The size of line weights change according to our scale, and as I told you before, we set 16 sizes. The values here are annotative. In other words, they are the widths of the lines on the paper when you print a project. I'm going to show you an example so it's easier to understand. The dashed line here is a hidden line. When I access the line styles, I can see it's in the projection one, the thinnest width. And for the current scale of 1 per 50, it measures 0.18 mm. If I set 3, it measures 0.35 and for 5, it's 0.7. So, this is not hard. But, now I want to show you a bug that is appearing on my version. If I cancel the changes, it returns to the settings I had before. However, you notice the line still continues with the line weight number 5. This should update automatically, but it didn't. Although, you don't need to worry, because it will happen once you make a change in the project. For example, 
change the scale and then return it back to 1 per 50. And now you can see the line how it was in the beginning. Now, pay attention at this detail, it's just curious. Considering the values by default, the smaller scale 1 per 10 has only 14 different projections because the sizes 14, 15 and 16 are all 9 mm. And the same happens on the other extremity. The scale 1 per 500 has the three smaller projections, 1, 2 and 3, as 0 0.1. And I think less than that value it will get too hard to visualize, so it's not good. Actually, just the scale 1 per 100 is the only one that has a unique value for all the 16 projections. So, if we want, it's possible to change the line weight values, but I usually don't do it. As we have a considerable big range, probably it will not be necessary to use all the projections. Anyway, to edit a value it's simple. We only need to click on a cell and type the new number. Ok, I leave it 0 0.5 as I really didn't want to change it. Then another thing we can do is adding a column of sizes for a new scale. I click on that and here I can add a new scale by selecting from the scales that are loaded in this project. For example 1 per 1000. And it will copy the values from the closest scale. If instead I add a scale 1 per 25, it copies the values of the scale 1 per 20 and 1 per 50 because they are the same. Then if I think it's relevant, I can change the sizes. So to delete the scale, you just select the one that you want and press delete. So these were the basics about line styles and line weights. You can always play around here, it's kind of fun and it's good for practicing. Crop region and crop views. With these tools at the properties window, we can decide which part of the drawing we want to view. Let's have a look at this. In this floor plan view, we decided we want to show just a specific area, for example the kitchen. Going to the extent section, the first three options are the ones that help in this matter, you will see. First, I need to activate the crop region and the rectangle appears on the screen. If you can't see anything, zoom out a bit until you see it. Then I can select the region and with the help of the grips, I can modify the rectangle to cover just exactly what I want. You can see, it's easy. Finally, I can leave it around here because what I want to show is the area of the kitchen. Then. The entire floor plan is still visible and that's because I have the option crop view switched off. I check that box, click on apply and then you can see that everything out of the area was simply hidden. If I want to hide the border but keep the same area showing up, just uncheck the box crop region visible. Ok, another thing and this is important, as you can see some annotation elements are still visible, even if they are outside the region. That's the case of these room tags. They appear because they belong to rooms that have a little portion of the area inside the box. But that's fine, due to that Revit has an extra option called annotation crop. Click there and then on apply. And now, when a crop region is selected, an additional dashed area shows up on the workspace. It's basically the range of the annotation elements. So if I modify the area, I can hide the room tags. And look, I make them disappear even if the area does not fully cover the object. A section box is like a crop region but for 3D views. Let's see how this works. I'm going to create a new copy of this 3D view called Ground Floor. 
Then in the Extends panel, there is an option to add a section box. I click there and now I have a box covering the full house. When I select it, you can see that I can manipulate its size easily with the grips. Look, this works in a very similar way as the crop region. So I'm going to drag the grip at the top face a bit down because I want to show a 3D perspective of the ground floor. It's easy as you can see. So this tool, I find it quite fun. We can also make section of views or I can also focus in only one story, like what I'm doing now. So just play around with this. To hide the section box, I select it, click with the right button and hide that element. It's simple. And remember, if we want to bring it back later, turn on the button Reveal Elements at the view control bar. And as you can see, there is the section box and there are also levels hidden here. This time I just want to select a the box, then I go to Unhide in view, and now it's again on this 3D view. Later, if I don't want the section box anymore, I remove the tick and it shows again the full project. Part 3 Some of the tips I will be showing here you may already know but it's never a waste of time to remind them. Then we will talk about view range and underlay in plan views. This can be a bit confusing in the beginning, so I will try to explain this the straightest way to the point as I can. Ok, I have opened a file in Revit. I'm going to start with these simple tips. Now, there aren't the properties in the project browser windows, which usually are located at the left of the screen. It's common that we close those windows for any reason, and then we can't remember exactly how to restore them. But don't worry, it's actually pretty easy. We can do that with the right button menu. And look, there are the properties, here at the bottom. Then repeat the process, go to browsers and choose project browser. So here you have both of them. I find it very important to use this menu, the right button menu, and play with those features. Our mind tends to memorize these options the more we use this. Now have a look at this view. I showed to you in previous chapters how to duplicate the view. If I click with the right button on this floor plan view, the ground floor. I have those options, duplicate and duplicate with detailing. In duplicate with detailing, it creates a new view exactly the same as before, including all the annotative elements. However, if I just choose duplicate, I create a copy of the ground floor without the annotation objects. Dimension lines, room tags or other text elements are not shown. However, rooms, yes because they are considered real elements. View range and underlay. This explanation requires full attention, as it will take several minutes. Now have a look at this different example. This is a project of a two-story house. We are in the ground floor. This is the first floor. Then I'm going to show you an elevation from the south, which has this perspective. Ok, going back to the floor plan, I'm going to click on view range, which you can find on the extent section. The view range defines basically what you can see on a floor plan, and be careful, this is not related at all with hiding elements. Now we imagine we are a bird flying above the house. And to be able to see exactly what we have here, we have to slice the building with a horizontal plane and get rid of everything that's above. But in which height is located that plane? Those settings is what we can edit on view range. Now I'm going to switch to a section which is the view from this vertical plane, towards that direction. 
The section one. Now to help you, I will enclose here the window of the view range. But have in mind if you are in a section or in an elevation, the view range is not available, only for floor plans. The values here are the ones set by default, but for now I suggest you to focus just on the primary range. The bottom is located exactly at the ground floor. You can see that the offset is zero. Then the cut plane is at 1500 mm above the same level, the zero ground floor. And the top range is at 2300 above the bottom. Now this is important. All these planes have to follow this order. It's not possible to put the top plane below the cut plane or the cut plane below the bottom. If we try to do it, we get a warning message. Also, the cut plane is locked at the ground floor, because it's the view that we are currently on. Now, I'm going to increase the Z coordinate of the cut plane, and I want to leave it above the doors. 2200 mm is fine. When I set that distance here, I can see the wall openings disappearing because they are no longer crossed by the cut section. However, the doors are still visible. Why? They are below the cut plane and above the bottom. We can see these things when we switch to an elevation. Look, we can consider the visible area here starting at the cut plane facing down towards the ground floor level. Another difference that we notice in this floor plan can be seen in the stairs. Before, the visible part of the stairs comprised around half of the rises, until I reached a height of 1.5 meters. But after updating the cutting plane up to 2200, the majority of stairs are now visible. Then, let's switch to the first floor. But before, I'm going to add the chair here, on the ground floor just next to the stairs. Then you will understand why I'm doing this. I'm going to switch to the first floor. Ah, and have in mind that I'm using a visual style with colors, consistent colors in this case, so I can understand the parts where I have a floor, which is in grey color. Here, if you look at the area around the stairs, there is an empty space, because the floor doesn't go here. We could supposedly see what is below, but we don't and also the chair that I have just created is not seen. This is because in the view range I have the same default settings that I had previously in the ground floor, but applied to the first floor. That's it, the view range doesn't cover the floor below, so if I change the bottom plane to the ground floor, by selecting it in this tab, ah, and I got this error message, the view depth can't be above the bottom, so let's set it as ground floor as well. And then the floor below and the stairs are now visible. Now I want to focus in a specific detail. When I change the bottom range to the ground floor, this tag that says freezer has appeared here. In fact, there is a freezer in the ground floor, which is not shown, because it's behind the floor. But, as you can see, the tag is still there. It doesn't matter if there is a floor above it. So, if these things happen in your projects, what you can do is hide this freezer from the current view. The only problem here is that sometimes it's hard to select a tag when it's under the floor. One of the solutions is hiding temporarily the floor and then I can hide in view, I mean the freezer. This time, I'm going to try a different tool for selection, the filter tool. I like this method, especially when I have plenty of elements and it's hard to select what I want. I open a selection area through everything, click on the filter icon, it's located at the modify tab, and here I can select elements by category. First, I will check known and then select the floors. There are two. Yes, the ground floor and the first floor. Now, 
I have to go to temporary height and select height elements. Now the drawing is even more messy with the ground floor elements shown, but that's fine. The only thing I need is finding the freezer and this time I will hide it permanently in this view. Finally, click again on the glasses and reset temporary hide isolate. Now let's talk about the top plane. In the first instance, it may seem a bit weird why do I need this plane? As we look down from the cut plane to the bottom, apparently the objects above are left behind. In fact, that's true for most elements, except those that belong to three categories, windows, casework and generic models. Here I want to show you an example for a window and a cabinet, but before, look at this nice feature in Revit, tile views, on the view tab. It displays all the open views in the workspace. That's interesting. Now the section 1 I don't need so I'm going to close it and move the other two in order to have them side to side. Now it's going to be easier to explain what I want. I changed the cut plane in the view range to 1050. And you can see that both window and the upper cabinet, which is from the casework category, are still displayed. That's not the case of the oven. So if I move it to that area, you can see that it disappears from the floor plan. The oven is not part of one of these three categories. Notice that the cabinet displays in the same way even if I move it to the place between the cut and bottom planes. And the same happens for the windows also. View depth. The view depth is not part of the primary range. It's an option to display elements beyond the bottom plane. Example. Let's draw some walls on the ground floor plan, just next to the exterior walls of the house. Ah, and their height, I want it to reach just the first floor. So I change unconnected option to first floor. Ok, now I will go to the first floor view and make sure the three planes at the primary view range cover just this floor, like in the image that I'm showing here. Then, the walls I have just drawn are appearing here because the view depth is set as unlimited. It means that everything below the bottom plan shows in the drawing. If I change the view depth to ground floor, from now on, it will have its limits there. The result is almost the same, except this little portion of the floor at the ground floor, which is located under the ground floor level, and that's why now it's not showing. However, look what happens if I change it to first floor. The objects below disappear. So what is the difference between bottom level and view depth? First I am going to change the view style to hidden lines. It will be better to understand. And first, I open a selection window to cover everything and I realize that the elements located in the view depth area are not selected. But I can select these walls individually by clicking on each of them one at a time. Another difference is that the line style for the objects just on the view depth is different. We can understand that by going to the line style under additional settings on the manage tab. Here the tag beyond is dedicated for the view depth. You will see, I'm going to change the line color to a blue one. And also, for example, the line pattern. Let's put a dash line with a dot. Click on apply and now you can see that it's easier to distinguish those elements. Ah, and this is important. If I want to restore the previous style, it doesn't work by pressing Ctrl Z and after clicking apply, it doesn't do anything if I cancel the window. Basically, I have to put it back how it was. 
Cuttable categories. Now I want to explain roughly how different elements act when they are crossed by the cut plane. Construction elements like walls, windows, doors, roofs are cuttable elements. For those, the section displayed is exactly where the cut plane intersects. On the other hand, most of non-construction elements like furniture objects are non-cuttable. That's the case of the things in this kitchen. There is a microwave here, an oven, a cabinet, a freeze, and also a table and chairs. They are always displayed in the same way, no matter where the cut plane passes by. These are representative elements, and usually there is no point if we show them just cut in half. Now look, if the cut plane crosses the microwave, nothing changes. Until it's completely above it, then, do you see? It does not display anymore. The same happens with the cabinet. Here, the result is not different, except that this element also displays in the top plane area, meaning that I have to move it completely above my view range to not show there. Now, I'm going to insert a window, but this time I want to load a different family. This one, you will see. Let's place it on this wall. Then, I'm going to move it a bit down, and you can see that when the cut plane intersects this area that makes an arc, the section shown in the plan starts to change, because the window is a cuttable category. At a certain point, when it's no longer intersected, it disappears from the view plane. But why did it happen if it's still in the view range? Because now the cut plane only intersects the wall and once the window is under it, we cannot see it in the plan view. Now I'm going to open a roof plan and have a look how roofs are commonly displayed. It looks like they are open in the middle. That's regarding the location of the cut plane. As the roof is a cuttable category, I can only see in my floor plan the section below. And you can better understand this by looking at the section view. Change the cut plane in the view range. I'm going to change the value to 2000, for example. And look, the cut section updates in the plan. To display all the roof, I can set a big number like 3500 millimeters. Then the top has to be either equal or higher than that. Click on Apply, and here you have the changes. You can see everything now. So, to return to the previous state, always press Ctrl Z. Underlay To explain to you the underlay, I'm going to use this example. Here, we have finished modeling the level 1, the ground floor of this house. Then, let's switch to level 2, which is the first floor, in order to model it. So, as you can see, this is the plan of the ground floor, and it's a bit lighter. In fact, this is the underlay. Basically, it's a layer used for our orientation when we want to draw elements here, in this case the first floor. So, it's easy to recognize it, and one of its characteristics is that we can't select anything there. On the underlay panel, we control the range we want to display here. At this moment, we can see the ground floor because the range is set from the level 1 to level 2. However, it may happen that in a project you are working, you don't see anything. If that's the case, your base level might be set to known, or you may have a range where there aren't elements yet. Another option here is the underlay orientation. If it says look down, it's like that we are a bird flying above, looking from up to the ground. If we change to look up, imagine now the house above our heads and we are looking from down to up. You can see the difference here, this time the door openings are shown because they are exactly at the level 1. And for better understanding this, Look it in a 3D perspective.
Part 4. In this section, we will talk about specific characteristics of the categories that you can find in the command component. As you remember, all these elements that don't have a specific command for its category go here. And some of those are furniture, casework, plumbing features, lighting, these we have already covered earlier, specialty equipment, mechanical equipment and many others. Here we will just focus in some of them and the first one will be furnitures. We are going to use this floor plan as our example and this section 1 to view the items in this perspective. Ah, and there is actually a section line here, but it's just hidden in this view. And remember, to reveal hidden elements in Revit, we click on the button that has the symbol of a bulb and look, there is the section plane. Now I'm going to click on the command component, in place a component, and now in this list I have already several families because I have loaded them before in this project. I'm going to start with this dresser. Then I can click to put it where I want. And in this case we cannot notice which is the front or back part as we can only see here a rectangle perspective. I go to the section view and this time I can see that it's placed correctly. Although if the shelves were facing the wall that's ok because it's easy to rotate the element. Just hit the space bar before placing it. And then it still works when the element is already placed on the plan. I can select it, push space to rotate it. And look that the space bar also works in the elevation view. Now I'm going to add another furniture family, which is this chair, M Chair Brower. This time I can recognize where is the back of the chair. Then let's insert a desk. This family has different types which differ in their sizes. When I go to the plan, you can see the pointer is located in the corner at the bottom. Most of the time, the position where I have the corset means it's the back part. If I leave it here, you can see that it faces against the wall. So just use the space bar again like we did before. An important feature to know about furniture families is that they are hosted by a level. Unlike other categories, for example a microwave, a specialty equipment family, we can offset it up or down from the level where we are. But for the furniture families that's not possible. Now look at the properties of this bed. On the part elevation from level is locked as you can see. Actually this makes sense because these items are mainly placed directly on the floor. Like chairs, tables, beds, dressers or closets. I know that we can put a chair over a bed but usually that's not a practical thing and we don't want that so that's why Revit has this constraint locked. We can find furniture families easily in the Revit libraries folder. First choose the country. Then all these folders are different categories. Find furniture and the families here are organized by these four kinds. Beds. Here you have sitting. Families for storage and tables. All those need to be hosted by a level. The exceptions are these three families located here. The TV and TV stand, we can offset them from the level. And the mirror, which is hosted by a wall. Now I'm going to give some tips about the casework category. The families here are mainly cabinets that can be used in kitchens, but there are also countertops. 
we are going to start with the base cabinets. I'm going again to the component and load the family from my libraries. Double click on casework, then base cabinet, and I'm going to insert this one with a double door and add it to the plan. However, notice that this is not exactly the family that I have chosen. It only has one door there, but it's fine, as it's still a cabinet. So leave it there. But why did this happen? The reason is, I have already loaded that family in this project before. I just didn't remember it. Look, if I click in the family and search in the list, here it is, the double door sink unit. It was already there. So, I insert one element like this, next to the other cabinet. Now, I'm going to switch to section 1, and you can see the perspective of these cabinets here. They look interesting. Now, let's see a different feature comparing with furnitures. Elevation from level is not locked, meaning that we can offset it from the ground and leave it where I want. If I type 300, it offsets that distance above the level. Then let's move it even more up. Flying. <laughs> okay, I know this is not a very logical way, but I'm doing it because I want you to remember something. When we switch to the floor plan, the casework flying is still appearing, even it's above the cut plane in the view range, but below the top plane. I can show you the view range window to check out those heights. And remember that only casework, windows and generic models are shown above the cut plane. Ok, this time I'm going to insert a corner cabinet. It has the purpose to be placed in a corner of a room and I can hit the spacebar to rotate it if I need it. I put it here, but actually it's not required to be hosted by a wall, so if I leave it in the middle of the room, it's fine as you can see. A corner cabinet shares the same characteristics as the remaining base cabinets. Now, let's see another tip about casework. If I drag the section plane to intersect the cabinets, you can see that they look different in the section view. Case work are cuttable elements, so I can see what is inside. Now, I want to talk about countertops, but before, I'm going to insert a corner unit here, and then I want a copy of this cabinet, and I can do it by creating similar. Look how easy it is and align it next to the corner cabinet on the other side. I can drag also this one here. Then the countertop is going to cover all these cabinets. In a 3D perspective, it looks like this. So I'm going to load a new component, go to countertops, and there are several here for choosing. In this case, it's more suitable for me these ones that have a chamfer in the corner. Then go to the corner, click, and now an important information. Countertops are parametric families. We can use those grips to adjust the size to fit our cabinets. For example, this one at the corner adjusts the countertop at the right. And then I could change this part, but I don't need, because it's already in the correct position. Also, this grip above just moves the countertop down here. Finally, I switch to the 3D and look that it fits perfectly above the cabinets. The casework category also includes tall cabinets, and the Revit libraries provide these three families. I select the first one, open it. I'm going to leave it in the room at the right. Ah, and move back the section plane. 
so I can view the main profile when I go to that section view. Look, here it is. And unlike base cabinets, tall cabinets don't need a countertop. Finally, there are also wall cabinets. These ones have a host element. Exactly, it's a wall. I'm going to choose this one. And look, that Revit doesn't allow me to insert it here, as I have to connect it to a wall. For example, I click here. And in a 3D view, it has this aspect. Plumbing fixtures. Among other categories available in the Revit libraries are the plumbing fixtures. These include the elements used in bathrooms, bathtubs, water closets, sinks, etc., as well as sinks for kitchens. OK, I'm going to add first a toilet here in water closets. And not all these families have the same parameters. For example, this 2D toilet only appears in floor plans and it's hosted by a wall. Yes, the rectangle on this side means that I have to attach the element at the wall. Let's place it. Look, can you see? And even it seems that the left part will stay a bit inside, when I click, it snaps exactly at the wall boundary. So it's very intuitive to place wall attached plumbing fixtures. Let's go back and look at this 3D toilet. It's not hosted, so I can place it wherever I want and it will show up in all the views. On the other hand, this commercial wall attached toilet needs a wall. And be aware that the wall here is not part of the family. It just indicates that I need the wall to place it. Let's open it. And the process is identically as the 2D toilet, as you can see. Now, this time, I want to load a sink family. There is a wide variety here, as you can see. Again, I can find 2D and 3D families. The difference here is that 2D sinks, let's choose this double 2D, display also in 3D views. If I attach it at this wall, look that I can view it also in the 3D view. And in the properties, the first parameter is the countertop height, in this case 900 mm above the level. So, the purpose of these sinks is to place them on countertops and not alone, like I have just done. It means I should insert a sink here and if the height don't match the countertop, I can easily change the value in the properties. Now you can explore all the families available in each category. We can find almost everything what is usually needed in a project. For example, in the electrical fixtures, I'm going to add a switch that requires a wall. And this element is not shown in the floor plan. Actually, the reason is that it's currently located above the cut plane. My cut plane is around 1000 meters and the location of this element is above. Its shape in a 3D view would be like this. Now, before finishing this chapter, I want to give you a useful tip. After loading many families into our project, it may be a bit hard to find the one that we need in this list. So for that, we can enter one or two keywords. For example, let's search for the sink in 2D. I type sink 2D and here it is. Railings. In the next part, we are going to learn how the railings work here in Revit. We can build railings on stairs, we have covered a little bit about this earlier, or we can add a railing to a floor, for example, to limit a balcony. In the example I show you here, I need railings there to avoid people falling into the ground. And this is the current perspective in a 3D view. Okay, 
the first thing I'm going to do, as this plan is a bit messy, is hiding some elements that I don't need for now. And also, you get a bit of practice doing this. So, first, I click in this dimension and hide the full category. And you can see that all the others also disappear. Then, I go to this bed, do the same thing, to hide all the elements from the same category, in this case, furniture. Then, to hide the plumbing fixtures, I can click on one of the elements of this bathroom. And finally, I just need to go to the kitchen, hide this freezer, and the remaining elements are casework. OK, now we can insert the railings. OK, we have to go to the icon at the Architecture tab and select the option Sketch Path. As I am in the sketch mode, I need to draw the railing, and I will stay with the method it's already selected, the Line tool. Make the first segment on the left, then click again at the corner to continue drawing, until I reach the wall again. Then click on the tick to confirm the railing, and switch to the 3D view to have a look at its appearance. Good, there it is. But, to be honest, I'm not very happy with this result. You can see that the railing is placed exactly in the border, and I don't think this is a very practical way to build it. Due to that reason, we are going to repeat this. First, delete the railing, and activate again the railing tool. And before drawing, this time, have a look at the options bar. First, I'm going to check this box, Chain, because with this, I will draw the lines continuously. Then, I want to assign an offset distance as 100 mm, because I don't want to have the railing exactly in the extremity. Go to the balcony, draw the railing, and this time I have a margin of 10 cm from the border. And look that the segments in the corner trim automatically while I keep drawing. Let's click on the tick again to confirm it. And then we need the second balcony. Other drawing method is with peak lines. Set the same offset distance. And then I head towards the second balcony. And now look, depending on the position of the mouse, I can offset in the inner side of the floor or outside of it. OK, now it's done. Go to the 3D view, and you can see they look better. However, if I don't like the shape of this family, I can go to the properties, and there are others here to select. Just click in the one that suits you better. This is a pipe style, and the last one, a glass panel. Part 5 In this chapter, I'm going to give you useful tips regarding railings, but not only. We will also see how we can copy elements to other floors, and how to keep them aligned with the former ones. So, have a look at this example. First, I want to place windows also in the second and third floors. How can we do that? Actually, it's easy. I'm going to click on a window, then right-click and select all instances that are visible in the view. In this case, I could also select entire project. The result would be the same. Then, I need to copy to the clipboard, then click on the arrow below Paste and copy the objects aligned to select levels. So, I choose the levels where I want the windows, Level 2 and Level 3. And it's done. You can see that this is a simple and a very useful method. Now, let's learn how to build stairs in a way that they reach from the bottom up to the last floor. So, the first thing is to make the stairs. 
and we are going to use the method that we have already been covering previously in this tutorial. Let's choose the location line at the left side, considering the exterior support. Click in this intersection for the start point and draw half of the stairs in this side. Then, follow the extension track line to place the second run and connect them with the floor above. To put it in the right position, I'm going to use the Move tool, select this run, press Enter, and then click in this point and move it to the intersection of the wall below. Click on the tick to confirm the stairs and exit the sketch mode. Ah, and as what usually happens, when I draw a stair in a U shape, the rail is not continuous. When you switch to a 3D view, you can see that there is a break here. This time, I'm going to solve this by just moving the position of the railing, so double click on it to edit it in the sketch mode and move the section that's on the landing a bit to the right. I'm going to set a distance of 10 cm, for example. Let's save this, and as you can see, the warning is no longer appearing, and the gap is now replaced with a flat section of railing. Now, we want to copy the stairs to the floors above. And there is a special button to do this process. I just need to select the stairs, and make sure you click on the stairs themselves and not on the railing. Then go here to Select Levels and Warning. Let's see what says. To create or modify multi-story stairs, you need a view where level lines are visible. So, I can't do this on floor plans, because I cannot see the levels, but this is a 3D view. It should work, of course, if I haven't hidden the level lines before. Let's go to Show Hidden Objects. And here they are. Click on one of the levels and unhide the category. OK, now I can repeat the process. Select Levels. And make sure you have this option turned on, Connect Levels. And this is going to be easy. Click on level 3, then hold CTRL and choose the level 4. Click on the tick, and now the stairs are connecting all the floors. So nice! Now we are going to focus again on the railing, and as you can see, the railing is not continuous along all the stairs. The method that I used is like copying the stairs to the clipboard and pasting them in the different levels. So, we also need the railing here, in the section of the floor. Ok, I'm going to switch to the level 1 floor plan and double click on the railing to go to the sketch mode. Here you can see these arrows, and they indicate the way that I need to go from down to up. Then, what I need is to add a railing section also here. This is easy. I'm going to use the Line tool, then go to this endpoint and draw it towards the other side. I can confirm the changes. And look, that section was added to all the floors at the same time. But keep in mind that this is not perfect as the railing is still not continuous on the turn to the next group of stairs. For now, we are going to leave it as it is. Although, it's possible to smooth this transition if you want it to appear that the railing also continues there. It just takes a bit of work. The final ending needs an extension here. But this time, I think the best is to add an extra railing in this side. I activate the command again, and I'm going to add it towards the point where I have the exterior wall. I can confirm the changes. And, ok, it's not perfect, we can align this better. Ah, 
and the align tool will not work here. So in this case it's better the moved command. After a few tries, I decided it's best to take the railing out of the place, activate move, select railing, press enter, click on the midpoint and place it exactly in the midpoint of the other railing. Finally the other extremity can actually stay there. This position is not very important, as you can see the result. Or even I could ignore the last segment, because it reaches the wall anyway and it's fine. In the next chapter we are going to talk again about annotation elements, in this case how we can insert text in Revit. On the annotate tab on the ribbon I'm going to click on the command text. So it's simple, click anywhere in the working sheet to start typing text. Now you can see that a special tab in the ribbon for editing text has opened. And look, there we can find the typical text options, such as bold, italic, underlined, at the list, among others. Now, if I click with the mouse in another point, I can add another text element. This time, let's look at the options that we can find in the panel leader. The one selected by default does not have any leader. Let's switch to this one and the text will have a one segment leader. Then here I can make a text with a leader that comprises two segments. And finally the last one puts a leader in an arc shape. Now, after placing the leaders, we can still edit them as we wish by simply moving these grips. For example, in the one at the middle I can convert the leader into segments. And the grip located at the arrow moves the position of the leader. So, regarding leaders again, notice that its panel in the ribbon has now different icons when we select the text element. Here on the first button we can add a new leader to the left side of the text. And it's possible to insert how many leaders that I want. Then if I click on this icon with a minus, I remove the last leader inserted. On the other hand, here I'm able to add leaders to the right side. These six buttons are related to the position of the leader both on the right and left sides. Although this only works when the text has more than one row. For example now, I can change the position of the arrow to above, below or to the middle. Another thing, the grips in the middle of the rectangle control the horizontal distance of the text. You may have noticed that the icons located below to add an arc leader are off. Actually, in each text element or I have all my leaders with straight segments or arc segments. Revit does not allow me to place both an arc and a straight leader in the same text. If I tick the option arc leader in the properties, I basically switch to an arc shape all the leaders there. And look that now only the arc arrows are illegible. This one at the right even it's a straight line, if I move the grip it creates an arc. Text types. There are several text types by default and they mainly differ in the size of the text. In this case, as I used a metric template when I created this file, the units here are millimeters. Texts are annotative elements and the size here actually is what measures in the sheet after printing. 
Notice also when I change the scale to a smaller one, the text elements readjust in order to keep the same size in the paper. In this chapter we are going to learn to make legends of the elements we have in the project. Let's see this example. We want to create a legend for the furniture that I have in the first floor. Examples are beds, drawers, dressers or tables. In this tutorial I'm not going to put all the elements in the legend, only some of them, as my goal here is just to teach how you do this process. In the View tab there is an option to insert a legend. Let's click on Legend here. Then choose a name for our legend. It can be Furniture Legend, for example. The scale we set 1 per 50 in order to match the one in the floor plan. Click on OK and the new view has opened. You can find it also in the Legends group in the project browser. And there were already a couple of legends by default that came in the template. Now to insert the representations of the furniture elements, beds, cabinets, tables, etc. We go to the Annotate tab and click on Component and then Legend Component. Now, to add the furniture symbols, go to the Options bar, click here on Family and select the item you want to add. Let's start with beds. First, I'm going to choose this bed in Bunk. And if you are not sure about the family or type, you can always check it out on one of your views. It's simple. Then, I will add this double bed and leave it aligned with the first one. Ok, this time I'm going to add a dresser. And now there is something I want to mention here. Look, this is the view of the dresser in the floor plan. It's just a rectangle and probably that's exactly what I need. However, in a hypothetical situation, it could be more convenient to put a view of this dresser in the way that it appears in an elevation. And to do that, we click on this tab and switch to the view that we want to show. I have chosen back elevation. Ok, after adding the legend components, I can add text to indicate which symbol corresponds. I'm going to place the first one here and name it Bedbunk. Then repeat the process for the next ones and look that it's easy to place in line with each other. At the end I can move each of the texts to be more in the center of the figures. Yes, texts don't snap easy to another object, I can just align them to the other text elements. So, now you can insert legends in your projects. You can create new ones or edit the legends that already exist. For example, the doors one. In this template there are originally these two texts. Then we can change them with the doors that we use in the project. And this time let's place them in rows. You can see that each text is easily aligned with the others. And then, if we need a representation of the doors in an elevation, we can select all at the same time and switch to elevation there. Part 6 Schedules In the next chapter, we will talk about schedules. Schedules are an essential part in Revit. And as you know, Revit uses BIM technology building information modeling and schedules are a very organized way to display project information as well as estimation of costs of the materials. In this tutorial we will cover the basics in schedules so you can start making your own tables. Let's have this example again of this two-story house. Here I have already inserted rooms and furniture 
And first, we are going to create a schedule to display all the rooms along with their areas. Let's click here on the project browser in Schedules and Quantities with the right button, and then click on New Schedule. In the window that has just opened, we need to select a category for the schedule. As you can see, we have a considerable variety of topics to choose. I go for Rooms. Then this is the name of the new schedule, and I can change it to a personalized one if I wish. Then below we have Phase. And what is this? This is related with the phases of construction in a project. Sometimes we have an existing building which we want to perform a change, for example demolish some walls and build new ones. In this example, as we suppose this is a new construction, we keep this option. Also, this is important to know. The phase is specified in all the elements we model in our project, and by default that is set as new construction. Therefore, if I change this to existing, I will have an empty list, as I don't have any elements in that phase. Click on OK, and now the next window is the schedule properties. There are several settings organized in the tabs above. In the first tab, we have to choose the fields of the columns, and the available fields may change according to the category of the schedule. As this is a room schedule, we are going to add the following columns. Area. Then click in this button to add it to the table. And then the others will be Name, the number of the room, and level. After, we can use these buttons to change the order of the columns, and the top field will be at the left of the schedule, and the bottom field at the right end. Press OK. And the table was automatically created. Now, let's see how to edit some properties here. First, look at the sorting. I'm going to click on Sorting Grouping, and I can sort by one or several parameters. Suppose I want to separate the rooms of each floor. In this case, level is the main sorting field. And also set ascending. First, I display the rooms at the ground floor, and then the rooms in the first floor. Next, I'm going to add a second sorting field. Let's say I want to have the room numbers in numerical order. And at the end I click on OK. OK, nice. Then go again to the same options panel, and this time I'm going to check this box header. And the rooms separate in two groups regarding the level they are located. Checking blank line adds an extra space below the last row of each group. Below each group, we can also add a footer. And we can choose from several options. Let's use this one by default, Title, Count and Totals. And it's going to display the title of the group, then it counts the number of rows, and adds a cell for the totals. Click on OK, and let's see the result. Here we can see the title, zero ground floor, the number of rooms, but nothing is shown for the area. Actually, if we want to calculate the total area, we need an extra step. And that's what we are going to see now. Go to Formatting. Ah, and notice that these are actually the panels in the Schedule Properties. I choose Area here, and where it says No Calculation, I'm going to change it to Calculate Totals and there are more options here that I may need in a different situation. I close the window, and here you can see that I add a total area for each level. Now let's see a couple of tips here. This first one is useful when I don't know the location of the rooms. When I click in a cell, the corresponding room is selected when I switch to a floor plan view, for example this one. Also, I want to tell you how I can change the text of the schedule. It's easy. On appearance, 
switch schedule default to a specific text. Then you can set a different text size for the title, header or the body. Ok, now I'm going to create a schedule about information of the furniture in the project. I go again to Schedules Quantities and create a new schedule. In this window, I'm going to choose Furniture in the category list. And this time, the fields that I'm going to add will be those Family and Type, Count and Cost. Then click on OK to generate the schedule. So here we can see all the furniture elements that I have in the project and on count the number of items of each type. But all the rows have only one item and even some elements are repeated. So how can I group the elements of the same type and count them? To do this we can go to Sorting Grouping and notice that this box is checked. Itemize every instance. I need to turn this off in order to group similar items in the same cell. Then on Sort By, I choose Family and Type, click OK and the list is much smaller now. The elements of the same type are represented in the same cell with the quantity that they exist in the drawing. Now let's see how we can calculate costs of the items within a schedule. First I'm going to increase the size of the first column, so I can see better the text here. Then, at the right I have the column for the parameter cost and there are two ways to insert values here. I can insert the cost of each item directly in the cell or add it in the properties of a specific family type. In the identity data section there is the value for the cost, so I can change it here if I wish and it updates on the schedule. Also, the cost that I put here only applies in this project. And most of the time the families have by default the parameter cost empty. Now, let's learn how we can make simple calculations in schedules, in this case for cost estimation. As you remember, the values in the cost parameter correspond to just one item. For example, I have 18 elements of this chair but 25 is just the cost of a single one. So in this example I'm going to add a new column with the total cost for each family type. Let's go to fields and this time I will add a calculated parameter. Click on this button, then insert a name for the new column, for example total cost, then the type of value I'm going to choose currency as it's what we need. And for the formula, I click here to check out which are my available parameters and I can see that there is only one, cost. Now you may think, but I also want to use the count parameter here, because what I want is to calculate count times the cost. That makes sense, but unfortunately count is not available for formulas as Revit uses a different method which we are going to cover right away. So first we will use only cost and what happens is that I copy the values of each row to this new column. Then what I need is going to formatting, select total cost and where it says no calculation I change to calculate totals and what happens is that the values are multiplied by the number of items. Finally, to add a cell for the total cost of the furniture, it's in sorting grouping and you can see below a checkbox for the ground totals. I click on it, I can set a custom title if I want and at this moment I will show the title, count and totals. Click in OK and this is how it appears in the table. If I don't need to show the total number of items, just choose title and totals instead. The column cost, I can rename it to unit cost to distinguish it from the total cost. Mm. 
Sheets. Now we are going to learn about sheets in Revit. A sheet, as you probably expect, is a view for printing the drawings of a project. Sheets can be found in the project browser and if there isn't any one yet, we have to right-click and create a new sheet. Then, in the window that opens, we can choose one of these title blocks. Here, you can see there are two models for two different sizes of paper, A3 and A1. Or we could just choose a blank sheet without any title block, this one called Known. I'm going to open the standard A1 sheet. And this is how it appears. Now, apart from these options, we can load the title block from the family libraries, here in Load. Then, where you have all the categories, there is a folder named Title Blocks. And then, you can see these ones to use in different paper sizes. Ah, and there is also a preview when we click in each title block. Anyway, let's go back to analyze the sample for an A1 paper. This sample, as you can notice in the logo here, is provided by Autodesk, and probably you want to create a personalized one, with your company brand, for example. But okay, we will see how to do this after. Now we are just going to look at the parameters that we can edit. First, we can rename the sheet title in the project browser. This window shows up and I can change either the number and the name. And look that they update automatically in the title block. Then we can edit the other parameters by clicking in each of them and put the name that we desire. Now, we are going to learn how to attach views to the sheet. As the title is Floor Plans, it's logical to add a floor plan here, of course. And you will notice that it's pretty basic. Just click and hold one of the floor plans and drag it inside the title block. So you can see it's very simple. Now, each view is composed by a title, in this case zero ground floor and view number one. Then where I have the drawing is the viewport. Basically, it's a window that shows everything that I have visible in that particular view. But now notice how the floor plan only fills one part of the viewport. The reason for that is because I have these elevation elements over there and the size of the viewport varies according with the area occupied by the drawing. Therefore, I'm going to switch to the ground floor plan and hide in view this category of elements. Now look, when I return to the sheet, the drawing stayed in the same position, but this time the viewport is smaller. Now it's adjusted just to the floor plan, as the elevations are now hidden. How can I edit the position of the viewport and the title? This is a bit tricky. By selecting the title, I can drag it to wherever I want, but if I want to shorten or stretch the line, I need to select the viewport instead. And now I can easily change the size of the line by moving these grips. Another important feature in every project drawing is the scale, and you can see that for this view is 1 per 100. It's just a scale that you adjust in the bottom of the screen in the view of the floor plan. Although, if I need a different scale, it's easy to change. Select the viewport, and in the properties the view scale is the first parameter. Change it to 1 per 50. And you can see all the dimensions change to double size. Also, notice that the scale in the title of the drawing as well as in the title block, update automatically, and you don't need to worry about that. Finally, I only need to place the viewport according with the position of the line. Now, in a sheet, we can add more than one drawing. Remember that this sheet is called floor plans, 
And the reason is because I want to put both drawings of the ground floor and the first floor. So now I need the first floor and this time I will show you a different way to insert a view into a sheet. Go to the view tab and on the panel sheet composition I'm going to click on view and then you can see all this list with all the views. Now I'm going to choose the floor plan first floor. This time, you can see that the scale of this drawing is smaller, 1 per 100. And also, the indication of the scale in the title block tells us to look at each drawing, as they are with different scales. I'm going to change the scale of the first floor to 1 per 50, like I did previously with the ground floor. And then, you can notice that after changing the scale, these elevation elements are visible again. So, I'm going to edit the view and I can do it by double click inside the viewport, as with this I can have access to the view. Basically I can work like I was in the floor plan view. I can insert, delete or move elements. Anyway, I'm going to hide the sections from the view. And the viewport is resized again to fit the visible area. And I just need to move the viewport a bit down to be in line with the ground floor and the title with the line. I can snap with the one of the ground floor. In this way they look better. Now in the last part of this tutorial we will learn roughly how to modify one of these sheets that come by default with Revit. It's easy. Now you can double click in the title block and you realize that a new window opens. It's actually the family file for this specific title block. And there we can modify anything that we need in this family, in this case this title block. For example, could change the position of lines, erase them, create new ones, etc. As an example, let's get rid of the symbol of Autodesk and replace with a different one. I'm going to select it and press delete. Next, I'm going to insert an image from my computer and let's choose the logo of Cad in Black, this one. Ok, the image is now here and then I'm going to resize the image with the grips that I have here. Then I need a text next to the image in the tab create in the ribbon. I'm going to type cat in black, click on an empty space, then I click on modify to exit a command and I'm going to move the text to fit with the symbol. When the title block is ready, I have to save it. Go to file and save it as a family. Then choose a name for it and now we can use the title block when we need. Going back to our file again. And now if I want to create a new sheet with this template, just repeat the process that I showed you before. Just do the normal process and load the family with the logo of Cad in Black. It's this one. Ok, that's all for now. Thank you very much for watching and don't forget to subscribe to Cad in Black to watch the full list of tutorials for beginners on Revit. There are also AutoCAD tutorials if you are interested. For now it's all, thank you very much and see you next time!